Hello and welcome everyone to today's Influential Minds, an EEI International Conversation Series. My name is Alekia Malavarupu and I'm a Senior Analyst for International Programs. Influential Minds are, is our virtual conversation series which aims to discuss ideas that move the needle towards a more sustainable future with thought leaders from across the globe. Today, EEI International Programs is excited to welcome Sebastian Malaby, Senior Fellow for International Economics at the Council on Foreign Relations. He joins us today to discuss his latest book, The Power Law, Venture Capital and the Making of the New Future, to help us navigate the world of venture capital and discuss its role in the energy transition. He will be joined in conversation by our host, EEI Vice President for International Programs, Dr. Lawrence Jones. Throughout the session, please feel free to ask questions using the chat feature. Dr. Jones will aim to incorporate as many of them in po as possible into the conversation. Without further ado, I will turn this over to Lawrence to get started. Thank you, Alikia, and good, good afternoon, Sebastian. I was gonna say good morning, but you're in London, so good afternoon for you. Thank you. Well, good morning or afternoon to you as well. It is, it is. Well, Sebastian, let me first of all, again, welcome you to Influential Minds. This is the first in our series for the fall. So uh, uh, no pressure on the conversation we're gonna have today. Let me begin by saying congratulations to you on the book. Uh, like I said to you before we started, you've kept my head scratching the entire couple of weeks since I've been reading this book because it's very well written and uh, really captures a lot of things that I think we wanna talk about today, given where the world is. But before we do that, you know, I want to go back and just ask you to tell us a little bit about Sebastian. You've written multiple books. You wrote a book on after apartheid. You wrote a book, More Money Than God, about hedge funds. Uh, you wrote a book about Alan Greenspan. You wrote a book about the world's bankers. And now you have this book out on the power law. Writing all of those books, which all seem to be very different. What have been some of the common themes you've come across? Because they all seem to have some correlation that they're written by a guy who's an economist. So <laughs> what are some of the key themes you've captured having written all those books? Well, I guess, you know, there is an evolution there in the themes, and I suppose it tracks my professional interests. I was a young reporter working for The Economist uh, magazine as the Africa correspondent uh, back in uh, 1989, 1990. And I was fortunate to be outside Nelson Mandela's jail uh, when he walked out in February 1990. And um, I realized two things instantly. One was, this was the most exciting moment I could possibly experience as a journalist. I thought my career would be downhill uh, <laughs> thereafter, even though I was only 25, because nothing could match the moment of Mandela's freedom. Mm -hmm. uh, I also realized rather more opportunistically that um, all the other books about South Africa were magically and instantly out of date. So I wrote this book about South Africa after apartheid, um, and that was in my 20s. Um, and then a period went by without me writing a book. But when I wrote the next one, it was also sort of about Africa, because it was about the World Bank and the World Bank's involvement in developing countries. Uh, and it looked at that question through the period when Jim Wolfenson was the president of the World Bank from 1995 to 2005. And it kind of told a story about the efforts of the rich world to be sort of constructively engaged in development in Asia, Africa, Latin America, and so on. Mm -hmm. And so there's a book about globalization and the finance behind globalization. And then I moved more into um, pure finance. I wrote this book about hedge funds. Um, More Money Than God, which came out um, in 2010. Uh, so that's a story about public market investing. Then I did a book about central banks, a biography of Alan Greenspan. Um, so that's not hedge funds, that's, that's the central bank. Uh, but of course they interact. The central bank is often fighting against the hedge funds and the hedge funds are trying to destroy some currency peg and the central bank's trying to defend it. So in a way that was the other side of the same um, um, narrative. And now this new book um, is another jump um, into the world of venture capital, a very different kind of financial specialty, where it's not about investing in stocks and bonds or about being a central banker. It's about startup companies 
uh, you know, which begin from nothing with a technology idea. And the first question is, how do you even think about investing in them, right? Because there's no, you know, in other investing, you've got the price earnings ratio. Well, I mean, there's no earnings when two entrepreneurs walk into your office with a dream and you're the venture capitalist and you're deciding if you should back them. So it's a very specialized kind of finance. I think it's a kind of finance with a lot of impact on the world because it's behind all the big innovations. Um, and so that's my most recent adventure. Well, the title of the book, The Power Law, uh, Venture Capital and, and the Making of the New Future. So, so as, a, as a scientist or, well, used to be scientists, got on a lot of research these days, but in, in physics, there are a lot of power laws, you know, the law, you know, gravitational forces, Newton's law, you know, you got uh, Stefan Boltzmann's law, you have laws on the decay of heat. A lot of these physical laws we learn in physics have some sort of a power law dimension to it, even though they're deterministic. And then you have the sort of a statistical power laws that really is not an input output kind of thing, right? So talk about power law in the context of venture capital. What is it? Describe it for the audience uh, so they can understand what do you mean by power law in the context of venture capital? That's a, that's a great question. Um, the easiest way to, to communicate the idea is I think to start with what the power law isn't in statistics. I mean, in statistics, you have this familiar normal distribution, which is the other kind of distribution. Um, and that's the one with the bell curve where the average, um, the mean is the same as the median. Um, and then around that median point, um, you, most of the observations in a, in a data set will cluster uh, pretty close to that average. And so you get this big fat bell in the middle and then the, you know, it tapers off into these thin tails uh, at, uh, at the left side and the right side. Um, and so if you think about you know, the height of uh, men in America. The average man is five foot 10. Um, the, uh, the modal man is five foot 10. Uh, and two thirds of all the men cluster between five foot seven and six foot one. So pretty close to that, uh, to that average. And, you know, there are some outliers. There are six foot seven NBA stars or six foot 10 NBA stars or whatever they are. But even they are only really 20% away from the average. It's not a big difference. So if you had a movie theater, right, with 100 men sitting there watching the movie and the NBA star at the back gets bored and he walks out halfway through the movie, the height of the kind of average residual man in the movie theater isn't going to shift very much, only a tiny bit, because that one big guy who walks out is only 20% bigger than the average. Now, now flip the, flip the example, right? We're not talking anymore about the average height of American men, but the average wealth of American men and the distribution of the wealth. And we've got the same movie theater and there's a hundred men there, but the person at the back is Jeff Bezos, right? Mm -hmm. And he gets bored, he walks out of the movie, the residual American man, the average in the movie theater of the other 99, the average wealth is going to plummet, not just go down a tiny bit, plummet. Because in a power law distribution, which is what, the wealth of American men observes. Um, you know, you've got Jeff Bezos, who's got multiples more, uh, not 20% more, but, you know, 20 or 2000 times more uh, than the average, right? Uh, and so there are some of these distributions where, you know, some people call it the 80-20 rule, uh, where, you know, 20% of the cities have 80% of the people, mm -hmm. or 20% of the flowers in the garden the flower plants in the garden generate 80% of the, of, of, of the flowers. And that's what it is like in venture capital. Um, a small minority of the investments that a venture capitalist does um, will generate the lion's share of the return. So if you have a venture capitalist who makes 10 investments, um, maybe seven or eight will lose money uh, because startups are really difficult to do and new technologies sometimes fail. And so you don't get your money back. But the hope is for the investor that one or two will do more than 10x the sum that you invest. So a return of a thousand percent or better than that. And so it's a power law distribution. Uh, and that's completely unlike what a hedge fund investor faces in the stock market or the bond market. 
and, and that really differentiates uh, venture capital. And it also, um, I mean, I'll shut up in a minute here, but just let me add one, one mm -hmm. point, which is that when you have a power law distribution, you have to think differently. You have to be willing to take these high, uh, high, you know, high outcome, but low probability bets, the real long shots. And you've, you've got to be shooting for that right hand tail of the distribution uh, where you're making more than 10x. And that's what it's all about. It's no good trying to be cautious mm. and place bets that probably will pay off, but in a more modest fashion. Mm. So in the book, one of the things that fascinated me are the stories. You have a lot of stories in the book. I mean, for, for someone who hasn't read the book, I must tell you, if you love history, if you love storytelling, this is the perfect book to read because almost every, every page comes into a story about something that had to do with the evolution of venture capitalism. And so talk to the audience a little bit about how you were able to get access to all of these people. I mean, you're, you're talking about the who's who in venture capitalism today. And you were able to get behind the scenes and narrate all of these exchanges with these folks for, for, for several decades of, of history. How did you do it? How did you get access and how do you go about doing this research? Well, the short answer is time. I'm, I take a long time over these books, like five years. And most of that time is because it does take a, a while to persuade people to sit down and open up and talk to me, not just for an hour or so, but maybe for four or five hours. Uh, you know, I go back two or three times to see them and we have long in-depth conversations and I follow up with emails and maybe we have another phone call at the end. And it's a big commitment for people who are very busy and they don't necessarily like talking about their investment secrets and they don't particularly like the media. So it is a challenge to get the access, but once you've got the access, that's what makes my books different um, because I really have um, sat down with, with the, you know, the, the all stars um, yeah. and I'm in a position to explain how they do their investments. And I mean, the secret is partly time and taking the effort to really lay out, you know, what I'm doing and, 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 but it's also, it's time in the sense that often I'm going at the beginning of the project, you know, I, 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 I know somebody who um, has liked my previous books and who has five friends in Silicon Valley. So I say, please, can you introduce me to those five friends? And I don't care who it is, I just go see them. And before I see them, I read everything about them and I learn everything I can. Mm -hmm. And I go in super informed and super prepared in order to communicate the message that when people speak to me, I'm grateful for that time that they are allotting and I really do my homework. And then that wins them over. And then they say at the end, wow, you really do your homework. Who can I introduce you to? And then they pass me on to five more people. And then my network starts to build, but it takes time. And it takes, you know, a couple of years before I really, I've seen the people who know the people who know the other people who really know the people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and bit by bit, I network my way into the, into the sort of middle circle. It's, a, it's also about building trust, right? Building, because you're getting some very, very intriguing uh, pieces of information so it's all about building trust with the with your interview candidates so to speak so let's let's get into some of the interesting stories uh first of all talk about the rebels the eight rebels who i would say transform silicon valley who are these eight individuals and tell us a little bit about their story and how they basically are the ones who got us venture capitalism more or less yeah so this is a an interesting story for many reasons but um there was this um, renowned scientist um, called William Shockley, who won a Nobel Prize for his contribution to the invention of the semiconductor. Um, and he had been at Bell Labs, he'd moved to the West Coast. Uh, so from the East Coast to the West Coast, he'd set up uh, a company called Shockley Semiconductor. And because he was this renowned physicist with a, a Nobel Prize, he could pretty much call any PhD in the country and say, will you come and work for me? And, and they would say, sure. And they would come because they were honored to get that phone call. It was like picking up the phone and receiving a call from God, uh, as <laughs> one of them uh, said later. So they came and worked for Shockley. And then as soon as they got there uh, to the West Coast, they realized that Shockley might be a genius, but he was also a very difficult guy. I mean, he would humiliate you. He would make fun of you, you know, um, 
one person came to work for him and then he just laughed when the guy showed up and said, ha, you settle for a really low salary. It shows you have no idea how to negotiate. <laughs> and then another person said that he would like to maybe do some research and you know, publish an academic paper. And so Shockley said, yeah, I'm not sure you're, you're really up to it, but I'll give you an idea. And he scribbled an idea down on a piece of paper and said, yeah, you can write this up and publish this. Um, so he was, he was very annoying to work for and it became ins insufferable. And so eight of these young, um, you know, brilliant young researchers uh, kind of banded together and they wanted to go join a different company. Um, and they didn't know quite how to do this, but they asked, uh, one of them had a father who had some money and was connected to a Wall Street um, financier. So they wrote to, to this financier's company um, and said, do you know anybody who would like to hire eight physicists who would like to work on semiconductors as a team? And the letter got passed around and it, it was given to a guy called Arthur Rock, who was a young uh, Wall Streeter. And he flew out to the West Coast and met with these eight uh, physicists and said, gee, you know, it's a great idea to leave Mr. Shockley, <clears throat> but why don't you start your own company? That way you won't have another bad boss. You can work for yourselves. And if you invent something fantastic and you really do well, you will share in the financial fruits of your own brilliance. And so this was a new idea and they didn't, you know, at first the, the eight physicists were scared of that prospect and Rock mm -hmm. said, you know, don't worry, I've got the money to help you. And they said, but we don't know how to form a company. And Rock said, well, I'll help you to do that. Uh, and, they, and he basically, he talked them into it and said, you know, I will, I will hold your hand about the business side of this. You guys know the, ph the physics side and we'll be a team uh, and, and we'll do this together. Mm. And that's how venture capital began on the West Coast. They were called the, the eight traitors mm. because back in 1957, when all this happened, it was highly unusual uh, to quit a company. You know, this was the era of big companies and big labor and big government. And the classic book of the period was called uh, Organization Man because everything was a bit bureaucratic and people joined these organizations and worked there until they retired mm -hmm. on their 60th birthday with a gold watch. But this moment of the eight traitors kind of opened up a new way of um, of doing companies. And, mm. and that was the birth of West Coast startups. We will come back to Mr. Rock because he's figured throughout the book in different places. But you mentioned West Coast. So let's talk about the West Coast, East Coast rivalry, right? So you had Boston with MIT. You had Silicon Valley with Stanford. What made the difference? Why did Silicon Valley win, so to speak, and Boston or the East Coast why did they lose? It's more or less. Well, this, is, this is a huge and, and fascinating debate. You know, when I began my research, sometimes people were telling me, you know, well, Silicon Valley is really Stanford Valley. Uh, Stanford is where all the ideas come from. And then people spin out and they do these great companies. And it's all about Stanford being excellent. And uh, I kind of nodded my head. And then when I actually did some reading and research, I realized that at the time when Silicon Valley really took off, back in the 60s, the 70s, and even the early 80s, MIT was by far and away a better engineering university than Stanford. I and mean, that's not true anymore today. Stanford's probably slightly ahead. But uh, back, back in the early period, that was absolutely not the case. And if you want to throw um, you know, Berkeley into the mix as the explanation for why Silicon Valley did well, you know, I can throw Harvard into the mix for the Boston ecosystem uh, and so I don't think it was because of academic excellence. And there, there are places like Carnegie Mellon, which were wonderful engineering universities, but never really had a tech startup scene. So I don't think it's about the academia. Rather, it's, it's actually about the business culture. There was this go-getting business culture on the West Coast. And I really do think that was because of the venture capital. The venture capitalists were willing to underwrite extreme risk on the West Coast. Whereas on the East Coast, there were some venture capitalists, but they were more cautious. They wanted to back a company only when it already had a product, maybe had a customer, certainly had, you know, a business founder as well as a technical founder. Um, whereas on the, on the West Coast, you could have a single person who had a brilliant idea for the daisy wheel printer or something, mm -hmm. had no idea how to do the business side, the sales side. And the VCs would say, no problem, you know, we'll come to us, we'll back you, we'll find you a partner to do the business side, 
um, and we'll be there with you all the way as you recruit great commercial people, salespeople. Um, and so they would back the company at a much earlier stage, take much more risk, be willing to see a bunch of their companies fail. That was the power law mentality I was talking about before. Mm -hmm. And so I really think the business culture of the West Coast distinguished it and allowed it to overtake the ecosystem in Boston. And it was because mm -hmm. of the venture capital. So interesting. So, so in the in the book, though, Sebastian, you you talk about many different interesting individuals that we'll spend two weeks going through, and we did all of them on this call. But there's there one. There's another one I want to talk besides Otto Rock. Let's talk about Bob Madcalf. And I like Bob Madcalf because obviously his his theory or his law, Madcalf's law, is one that I believe in. That you know, the more things you connect to a network, the value increases by the square. So just talk about Medclap. Why is he such an intriguing figure in the context of venture capitalism? Well, partly because he actually was an MIT graduate. Mm -hmm. um, and he came out of MIT, he moved to the West Coast and he spent some time um, at uh, Xerox Park, which was you know, the research subsidiary of, of um, Xerox. And he got very frustrated at Xerox Park because of this thing, the innovator's dilemma, mm -hmm. you know, where lots of good invention can happen inside a big corporation. But if it's going to threaten the core product of the parent company, probably those innovations will not be commercialized. And Bob Metcalf himself invented Ethernet, um, that technology for, you know, hooking up your computer with your printer, with... Mm -hmm. Um, your disk drive with other people in your local area network. It's been a bit superseded now that we all have, you know, wireless connectivity. Um, but back in the day, Ethernet was a core invention that allowed networking to happen. Um, and basically, you know, Xerox played around with it a bit, but was not really going to commercialize it. And so um, Bob Metcalf got frustrated. He set up his own company, uh, 3Com, uh, to commercialize his own invention. And because he was, you know, originally from MIT and he kind of preferred the uh, East Coast and he thought West Coast VCs were too pushy and arrogant, he said, right, I'm not going to raise venture capital from these arrogant so-and-sos uh, in, in California. And I will go raise from, from the nice, genteel, you know, sensible people uh, in Boston. Mm -hmm. So he went off to Boston. He found somebody who would back his company, 3Com, and before he signed the deal, he discovered what he called later the oh, by the way syndrome, as in, oh, by the way, we just thought of one more condition that you need to meet before we sign this deal with you. And the first thing was, oh, by the way, we need you to find another investor to share the risk with us because the Boston VCs were not all that risk hungry. Mm -hmm. And so Bob Metcalf scrabbles around, he goes and finds another VC in New York, and the New York VC says that, you know, he's happy to invest as well. And Metcalf goes back triumphantly to the Boston guy and said, OK, I've got another investor. And they, they, the Boston guy says, oh, by the way, I really <laughs> meant a California investor. <laughs> and so Metcalf scrabbles around and finds a California investor who's willing to put some money in. And then it's, oh, by the way, we really meant a California investor who put a lot of money in. And so Metcalf scrabbles around and finds somebody. And then, you know, it just goes on like this. And there are all these conditions. And eventually Metcalf realizes that he spent so much time trying to raise funds that he's actually run out of the little money he had to get started by himself. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for an entrepreneur, time is money. It's the, you know, time is the most valuable resource. And so he ended up just getting completely fed up and going to the, to the West Coast venture capitalists doing a deal with them in, inside of 24 hours and um, saying to them, look, I've got one condition, which is that Boston VC, it was Fidelity Ventures, um, that promised me money. We're not gonna take any money from them at all. I'm just so sick of them. And then he called up the Fidelity Ventures and said, you're out, I don't need you, get lost. And they said, but we were the only ones who were willing to back you when nobody else would. And Metcalf said, you are the only ones who lied to me when nobody else would. <laughs> and so to me, this is a story about how, you know, the West Coast venture capitalists were far more risk friendly, mm -hmm. far more fast to provide capital. And that explains why in the 1980s, when 3Con got started, mm 
it really was a case of, you know, the West Coast overtaking the East Coast, not because the science was better, but because the business culture was more go-getting. Mm, interesting. I, I want to I wanna stay on the issue of business culture because I think fundamentally where the world is today, we're going through a lot of changes. There's a lot of discussions about, you know, the need for capital investment in the clean tech space. And, and when we look back and try to understand some of the successes in Silicon Valley, one of the things you talk about in the book is weak ties. And you get into this whole discussion around uh, porous boundaries that existed between the companies in the East Coast, I mean, the West Coast vis-a-vis -vis the East Coast. How important is it for clean tech that we have more porous boundaries between startup companies for us to accelerate the development of clean technology. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure, I mean, maybe I'll, I'll talk a bit about the importance of loose ties in general for tech, and then we can move on to the clean tech specifically. Mm -hmm. But my point really is that um, you can have two ecosystems uh, and they might have the same number of talented people in them, but one will be more productive than the other. And this is a bit of a mystery in economics. You know, economics has various things to say about clusters and why clusters of talented people are productive. But it doesn't really tell you why one cluster of the same size would be better than the other one. And so I was kind of scratching my head about this. And eventually I found the answer, or the best answer I could find, it was in sociology, not in economics. And it was basically about how, you know, if you have a lot of um, sort of co connective tissue within one cluster, where if you imagine a, a sort of a diagram of the cluster with all the nodes representing different talented people, and then there are lines between the nodes. And if the nodes are more connected, um, it means that they're kind of sharing ideas and, and, and insights and, and sort of theories and, and hypotheses together more. Uh, and so just like in the brain, if the neurons are more connected up, you'll be more creative intellectually. It's the same thing with clusters. If they're more connected up, you know, the ideas and the money and the people will flow around the ecosystem more dynamically and, and result in more experiments. And a sociologist from Berkeley called Annalise Saxenian had pointed all this out in a book in the 1990s. And I think what I contributed was to say, why are these uh, connections so fertile on the West Coast? It's not just because you have startups that have sort of low boundaries between the startup and the other startups. It's also because the venture capitalists are people who are financially incentivized, right? To get up in the morning and have breakfast with one person who might be an entrepreneur or somebody that an uh, entrepreneurial company might want to hire or whatever. And after that breakfast to have 17 cups of coffee, you know, hopefully decaffeinated before they go to bed with mm. other entrepreneurs, other potential financiers, you know, 10 people who might be good candidates to be hired by the companies that the VC back last month. You know, it's all about connecting people. That's what venture capitalists do. Mm -hmm. And so this interconnectedness of the West Coast meant for, made for a more creative experimental ecosystem than the vertical hierarchies of the East Coast, where somebody would join a big company like DEC or Wang and and basically stay within that company and, and circulate only within that company. So that would give you strong, deep ties, but not lots of looser, weak ties. And as you say, Lawrence, uh, it's the weak ties that are more fertile. Mm, interesting. So, so let's, let's talk about, we're going to pick one of them, but for those who haven't read the book, Power Law, Yahoo, Apple, Cisco, Google, Amazon, Facebook, all of them benefited from venture capitalism, correct? correct? Let's just talk about Apple, because I think the Apple story is very interesting in terms of who decided to fund Apple and who didn't fund Apple in terms of placing bets. So just talk a little bit about that whole Apple story and what happened and, and, and where things stand today. Right, so we have to go back to the 1970s, of course, when Apple got started. Uh, and remember that Steve Jobs at the time, um, was not the you know absolute sort of um, kingpin of you know the kind of embodiment of West Coast creative entrepreneurial genius, which is what he became later. At the time, he was this extremely scruffy college dropout 
um, who went around with bare feet. He was said to, you know, wash his feet occasionally in the toilet uh, to eat a fruitarian diet, you know, just generally look as if he'd, you know, been in some sort of, you know, as one venture capitalist told me, he'd just been off to see his guru in India. I think that was actually literally true. He had just been off to see some gurus in India. In any event, he didn't, you know, from a 1970s perspective, he didn't look like the kind of engineer that you would want to back, right? In fact, he wasn't even an engineer. He had this friend, Steve Wozniak, who was a real engineer, but who was kind of tongue-tied and shy. And so there were these two Steves. And most of the people who, who met them in the early days thought, no way am I going to invest in these characters. I mean, who are they, right? Um, and so uh, Steve Jobs went to try to raise money from a bunch of different people. And each of them would do this networking, weak ties kind of thing, where they would say, you know, gee, I'm sorry, I, I don't want to invest right now. But, you know, if, if you want to really do this company, I could introduce you to a couple of people. Uh, and then they would make a couple of introductions. And Steve Jobs would meet with another couple of people and he would be passed around um, the, the Silicon Valley ecosystem in this very networky, strength of weak ties kind of way. And eventually he meets this guy called Mike Markala, who's not really a VC, but who is a, an exited entrepreneur who retired young, having made a bunch of money uh, by being a, a senior salesperson at a couple of different semiconductor companies. And Mike Markala, you know, gets out, you know, he's made some money. So he's got this kind of uh, rather gaudy, I think it was a gold colored Corvette. <laughs> and he drives up to this garage where Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak are hanging out and he gets out and he's got a sort of big flashy lounge suit and he walks in and there are these scruffy slightly sort of uh, smelly young characters uh, uh, but he gets past them and he looks at the circuit board that Steve Wozniak is building uh, for the Apple computer and uh, because uh, Mike Markler knows about circuit boards he's an engineer himself he ignores the Steves and looks at the circuit board and says, gee, this is one elegant circuit board. <laughs> and so finally, uh, through a process of like introduction after introduction after introduction, the Steves get lucky. And the character with the flashy lounge suit is the one who connects with them because he doesn't actually look at them. He looks at the engineering <laughs> and the wiring. Um, and uh, so, so Mike Markler is so enthused by the circuit board that he says, okay, I'm going to make an investment. I'm going to help you out. I'm an engineer. I'm going to work with you pretty hands-on. And you have no idea what you're doing in terms of building a company, but I will help you out. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, Mike Markula starts, starts connecting with you know, venture capitalists and with other people like the famous uh, Silicon Valley um, publicity guy back in the day, Regis McKenna, who was the person who would design your logo and get you some publicity, get you on the cover of a magazine. And, and you know, Regis McKenna had said, no way would he work with this guy with no shoes. But when Mike Markula asked him, you know, then he was part of the network and sure, of course he would do it, you know. And so it was that kind of thing. And that's how um, Steve Jobs eventually went from this Silicon Valley, you know, renegade uh, to being part of the magic circle that raised money and that, you know, got advertising, was on the cover of magazines and that, you know, managed to build Apple. So if when you look at all of these companies, the big ones who were able to benefit from power law, right? We've mentioned some of them before. You can add to the list Uber and, and, uh, and uh, 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 Tesla and a few others, right? right? And if you were to talk to a young venture capitalist today, there's a question in the, audience, uh, in the chat about uh, what advice would you give, right? So based on all these companies, you've looked at all these stories, what are three things you would tell a young VC who's getting the clean tech space, for example, what are three things they should be thinking about uh, in, in terms of wanting to seek funding to promote their idea? Ah, so are you talking about um, somebody wants to get into the uh, entrepreneurial side or the funding side? The no, someone, someone who wants the money, someone who someone wants, who the, wants money. the money, right? So, so yeah. in the book, you talk about network, you talk about weak ties, you know, there are a lot of different Different stories. In fact, each of these companies went down their own journey. They had their own iterative mistakes or successes. But if you were to identify three things, Sebastian, that seem to be common for all of these organizations, 
who were looking for money, what would those th three things be? Sure. So the first thing you need for a startup in this in this technical space is you need a technical idea. Um, so you need to have a convincing story about a, a, a technology that doesn't exist yet, but that if it were to be built, um, really would address a need, um, that there would be product market fit. Um, and uh, that's the first, that's really the first thing. And it's gotta be a big market. And that's the, the second thing is, is the commercial side. That if you built this thing, not only would it be needed, but it would be needed in quite large quantities such that you could sell a lot of it. Um, and, you know, talk about revenues that would quickly run into the millions and then the tens of millions and then the hundreds of millions. Because remember the power law, you know, the power law means that most startups fail. Most ideas for new technologies fail. That's the unfortunate, brutal logic. And so every single one that gets backing needs to have a chance of being a 10x plus outcome that, you know, if it raises, let's say, $25 million of investment capital, it's going to be worth more than $250, $250 million uh, within five or six years. That, unless you can plausibly tell that story, you're not going to get funding. So mm -hmm. number one is that you've got this technology that you've understood that you know how to build it. Number two is it's going to be a big enough market. And then number three is be resilient. Don't give up. If you think you've got those first two things, don't be discouraged when the first 10 people tell you you're crazy, they're not going to fund you, that, you know, you only need one or two people to believe in you. And then it will turn out that the 50 who did not believe in you just don't matter. Hmm, interesting. Interesting. So you mentioned failure, right? One succeeds, nine fail. How do we get our culture to embrace failure? Because in one of your conversations I listened to, you talk about how failure should be valued more. How should we value failure? Because I think we don't. How do we do that? Well, again, um, you know, I, well, I think you're right, first of all. It is a um, sort of counter-instinctive thing for human beings to be okay about failure. I mean, behavioral economists tell us that we have uh, loss aversion. We don't like to fail. We don't like to lose what we've got. Um, we will take far more, put far more effort and, and take more risk to sort of, you know, preserve what we have um, than, you know, than to shoot for the upside, right? So most people don't want to be entrepreneurs because they don't want to fail. They'd rather do something safer. And most investors actually don't want to back entrepreneurs because they're scared of the failure too. So as a culture, to have entrepreneurship and to have venture capital, we have to overcome that instinct. I think the good news is that venture capital has now, you know, since those early days that we just talked about with the traitorous aid back in the 50s and in the 60s, you know, the world has come a long way and there is this cadre of venture capitalists who have understood that failure should be okay. Um, and they're willing to underwrite firms, startups that very well might fail. Um, so I think the way to overcome this fear of failure is to have plenty of venture capital. Um, mm. And that's what turns failure by an entrepreneur into a disaster, into a learning experience, because actually a venture capitalist may well back the second company that a venture capitalist who failed the first time wants to do. In fact, some VCs say, we love people who come back with the second idea, because if you are somebody who did a first company, battled hard for three years, ultimately, you know, sold it for maybe less than the money that was put in, um, but you really gave it all you had. And now you're coming back for a second company. Wow, you are one tough individual. And mm -hmm. we believe in that. We believe in struggle. Um, so, it, you know, the first company that fails can be a learning experience because of venture capital. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like an iterative process, right? You fail, you come back, you fail, you come back. And at some point you're going to strike gold and you'll be okay, right? Uh, so let's go out of the U.S. for a second. In the book, you talk about, you know, different countries. You interview people in China and, and, and Asia. So what surprised you about the venture capital culture that you saw in, say, in China, in Europe? And then just quickly talk about Israel and Africa. 
what's the potential of venture capital in those countries as well, or that, that continent, but also in Israel? Yeah. Well, the thing that surprised me the most about all of my research for this book was going to China. Uh, and the reason is that um, before I went to China, you know, I read um, some books about the technology sector in China, and I read that the government had been supportive in um, making this digital industry arise. And I figured that kind of made sense because the government plays a big role in everything in China. It's state capitalism after all. Um, and so then I went to China and I spoke to all the people who were involved in the early takeoff of Alibaba and Baidu and Tencent and Sina and Sohu and, and all these digital companies in the early days. And what was amazing to me is that it wasn't really a story about government support. Actually, all of these early companies, again, Alibaba, Baidu, Tencent, Sina, Sohu, NetEase, Seatrip, whatever, each net, all of them, they all had American style venture capital. Mm. And in fact, they had been pretty much ignored by the government because, you know, the government's tech policy was they wanted to back, you know, kind of more complicated deep tech hardware. They were very keen on backing a, uh, a semiconductor industry back in the 1990s. And that stuff mostly failed. But um, in, the, in the consumer internet area, which is of course where I, Alibaba and Baidu and all that stuff, you know, they were consumer companies. The government thought, oh, consumer internet, who cares? And so they kind of didn't focus on it. Mm -hmm. And that left the field open to Silicon Valley type investors who incorporated those startups under New York, uh, with dispute settlement under New York law, with parent companies offshore in the Cayman Islands, and the ability to do stuff like issue stock options for the early employees. And this was crucial. So Alibaba, for example, became a world-class company because it could hire world-class people, and it could hire those people because it could issue stock options, because the American venture capitalists had shown up with American Silicon Valley uh, lawyers mm -hmm. who had structured the companies with the ability to do uh, equity stock options, which really were not a thing in China. In fact, you couldn't translate them into Chinese at the beginning. Mm -hmm. So I think my point is here that, you know, the reason why Silicon Valley took off was venture capital. The reason why China internet took off was venture capital. Venture capital turns out to be the missing ingredient in all of these tech ecosystems. Um, and Israel is kind of the same thing yet again. It's a, you know, it's a little bit different in the sense that the government did very cleverly kickstart the venture capital business in Israel. Um, it, it basically issued a promise that any private venture capitalist that wanted to set up in Israel would get a lot of subsidies for their first funds to get them started. And that did attract a lot of uh, private capital into Israel. There was also the fact that the Israeli army um, hires some of the smartest young uh, scientists and, and mathematicians when they're 18 and brings them into a special army unit. And those people kind of work together, they bond together, they're trained in computer science and cryptography and all of these key skills. And they do that for the Israeli military for a while and then they spin out and do their own companies. And when they spin out, they all know each other because they've worked together. So it's a bit like that strength of weak ties kind of thing, you know, like in Silicon Valley, you can do due diligence on a potential tech founder in Israel very easily because they're all part of this military originated network. And those things, plus the government support for venture capital, kickstarted the, the network. And now today, Israel actually has more sort of VC and more startups per capita than any other country in the world. So it's a small country, obviously, but with a, it punches way above its weight. Um, and then if we go to China, for, if we go to Africa, Southeast Asia, and Latin America, what I'm seeing there is sort of a repeat of the story where, you know, VCs are moving in. They're usually um, American trained VCs and they understand the power law and they are repeating their magic. I, I had a wonderful conversation with an Indian uh, venture capitalist. Uh, if, you, if, you, if you'll indulge me for a second, I'll tell you an anecdote that is not in my book, um, where I was chatting after my book came out uh, uh, with a, a Bangalore-based venture capitalist for Axel, uh, 
And he explained to me that he'd been in America, he'd been to American business school, he worked for Intel, he was an engineer. Um, and then he'd come back to his native India and he started doing venture capital. And so I said, okay, so 2010, you come back to India, 2022, uh, we're speaking to each other. Tell me how things changed between 2010 and 2022. And so he said to me, okay, well, in 2010, I did some investments. And after a while, one of the founders who I backed came to me and said, I need some help. And as a VC, the VC says, sure, I, I always, I help my founders. That's what I do. And the founder said, okay, I need some help. What I need is I want to get married. And the VC goes, mm, it's a bit surprising. <laughs> you know, sure, he's there to help, but not normally for marriage intermediation services, right? Uh, but the VC says, you want to get married? Okay, sure, what can I do? And the startup founder says, well, um, so I'm, on, I'm an entrepreneur and my girlfriend's father thinks that entrepreneurs are all losers. But you, Mr. Venture Capitalist, you've been to American Business School, you work for Intel, you're a person of high standing and stature. Uh, and so if you call my prospective father-in-law and explain to him that entrepreneur does not equal loser, then he'll let me marry his daughter. So <laughs> the VC says, okay, I get it. And he makes the call. The marriage goes ahead and I say to him, that's a great story. Now, tell me about 2022. Are you still making those phone calls so that marriages can proceed? And he says, today, I don't need to anymore because all of the father-in-laws are watching uh, the movie, I mean, the TV series about VC, uh, Shark Tank. Mm. And they are watching Shark Tank in Hindi, the Hindi version. Uh, and the point here again is that when you have venture capitalists who are active in a country for 10 or 12 years, you change the culture. You change entrepreneurship from something that looks like dangerous failure and losers. And you change that into something which is high status and people actually want to be entrepreneurs and they're happy for their daughters to marry entrepreneurs. Mm. They're happy for their daughters to become entrepreneurs, hopefully. Um, uh, and so I, I do think that, you know, venture capital becomes a machine for manufacturing entrepreneurial courage. I like that, the machine for manufacturing entrepreneurial courage. Well, we got about 10 minutes left, uh, Sebastian, which makes me upset because we haven't even gotten into all the other parts of the book, but it is what it is. I wanna move to the last chapter in the book and spend the rest of our time because there's a lot of stuff in there. Specifically, let's talk about feedback effects and 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 just, just talk a little bit about how important the success leads to success, but then the risk of reputation of failure. How is that important for anyone trying to either borrow money or get money from VCs or get into the VC space? How important is reputational risk or reputational effects? Yeah, I mean, um, this is a huge question about uh, any business um, or creative endeavor where, you know, when a whole bunch of people like something and and you you get a good reputation you're much more likely to get more followers more fans more people who buy in right uh, and this again gets back to this power law stuff right feedback loops allow whoever is the leader in a particular field like the biggest influencer on instagram um will get even more uh, followers because you know you've got so many followers already they talk to other people and they become your followers too um, and there's this terrific social science experiment which kind of proved this point by um, constructing a, a bunch of songs uh, on a song list on, on a computer and then asking somebody to, to listen to the songs and download the two um, that the first listener liked the best. So that, you know, there's 20 songs, you listen to the songs and then you repeat that process with, you know, 50 other people who come on the site and they they listen and each time the next person who comes can see how many likes and downloads the, pre the, you know, the previous listeners have awarded. And of course it happens that you know, there's social proof. And so the songs that already have the most likes carry on getting more and more likes as you go through the experiment. And after a hundred people, there's this power law effect where there's this outlier winner, clearly the best song, it's got, you know, 70 downloads, and then the number two has got 30, and there's a whole bunch who've got like seven. Um, 
And um, uh, so it looks like it's clear which is the best song. But then the researcher repeats the whole experiment with the same list of songs, the precise same list. And again, there's a power law winner, but there's a totally different one. <laughs> and what that's telling us is that in venture capital, there could be a thing going on where a whole bunch of investors start in one year, in, in year one. And then, you know, three of them get lucky and they have this, they back some company that turns out to be a unicorn. So then they have this wonderful reputation. All of the best entrepreneurs go to them. And through no skill of their own, they carry on doing well because the best founders of startups are coming to them and wanting their money, not somebody else's money. So I was a bit skeptical about uh, venture capitalists when I began writing my book. Mm. And I almost didn't write the book because I thought, hey, well, maybe it's just luck, right? <laughs> um, and it was only when I really uh, drilled down more into the subject and I started to spend time with these investors and they gave me these very kind of logical reasons as to how they do the investment, how they have add, add value uh, and help companies that they invest in that I understood it was not just luck and path dependency. Uh, and it was not just reputational effects. There is really skill in yeah. being a good venture capitalist. And there's also skill in being the right entrepreneur to sort of pick the right venture capitalist because it's a marriage, right? Those two things have to look at the stories in the book. You had a lot of tension between the VC and the entrepreneur. Um, we got about three minutes. Uh, sorry, we got about five minutes left. I want to try and squeeze in three quick questions. The first one is sort of a broad this conversation. So you, you were the Council on Foreign Relations. Uh, talk a little bit about the geopolitics of venture capitalism. I think it was one of the most fascinating sections in the book, reading about the geopolitics of VC and what it means for the world. Can you just say a few words about that? Yeah, so just quickly, I, I mean, my point is that, that um, geopolitical power uh, is completely connected to technological power. I mean, if you imagine the power of the United States without a company like you know, Microsoft or Intel, it would be much less. If you imagine the power of China without Huawei uh, or a company like SenseTime, uh, it would be much less. So to have national power, you need a national technology base. And for that, it's helpful to have a great venture capital business as well. Okay, two quick questions to wrap up. First one, you kind of alluded to when you talk about Israel. But the idea of government-backed science, right now we're looking at a lot of governments investing in clean tech. The energy transition is attracting a lot of money from the private, from the government. How is important is the synergy between government-backed science and venture capitalism? I think it can be super productive, but you have to get it right. Government money should go into basic research. That's really important and constructive. Government money should go into um, training uh, climate scientists and PhDs that are going to be helpful. That's really good. I don't think it's so great to put government money into the investment funds too much because we've had experiences of that. And, you know, in Europe, for example, one of the problems for the tech sector has been actually too much government money that tends not to be the most go-getting sloshing around. So I think you have to be careful how you allocate the government money's money. Okay, so this is a question that, I, that I've been thinking about since I read the book, and it's about the fact that you say network's important, the density of the population in terms of Silicon Valley, for example, is important, but then you have a lot of countries around the world that have small population. So I have this idea, and I want to see what you think about it, and I talk about creating a virtual VC world, where instead of you physically being in Silicon Valley, you can bring together this sort of a metaverse of VCs and still create the same sort of environment. What do you think about that idea? I think that's a fantastic idea. Um, and I hope that's exactly what's happening in Africa, for example, where you have a lot of small markets and you need a, a VC system that is cross-border and that knits together different groups. And you can do that now with modern communications. And so I'm hopeful that we will see VC flourish in Africa. Okay. Well, so I always like to end these conversations by having a little preview into the mind of the author. So in this case, tell us what's next for you, because I have a 
very brilliant idea, I think, that I would love you to write on. But let me see what you have in mind first before I give you a, another assignment. So what's next for, for Sebastian in terms of writing another book? Well, I can't wait to hear what your assignment is. But uh, my idea for the moment is to try to write something about artificial intelligence. Um, I've also looked at crypto, but I'm, I'm slightly more drawn to artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. so, so here is one that I think will be very fascinating for you. The world has billions of people who lack access to energy, billions of people who lack access to water. And we talk about raising those billions into sort of uh, the world and having them part of the world society. How can we sort of uh, change how we do development? Coming back to your original book about the World Bank, mm -hmm. and you have a lot of other books being written. How do we really raise billions of people out of poverty and create wealth without sort of what burning the planet even further? I think that would be a fascinating book if you could take that on for five years, and I'll have you back in five years to talk about the book. <laughs> okay, terrific. Thank you so much for having me. Well, thanks, Sebastian, and thanks for joining us. And I'll turn over to Alikia to give you information how you can get access to this information. I'll see you in DC, by the way, when you do show up in the next uh, month or so. Okay, terrific. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Sebastian. Bye-bye.